gonna stay inside now, okay? The bugs are out. Sorta. Sorta. Hand the line back up. Yeah. Hop in. Well, we had a really nice night last night. We anchored in the Nermanto River. I think it was Nermanto River. Um, just north of the ICW, uh, there's a little oxbow up in the river. It was really nice, about 12 feet of depth. We uh, put the dinghy down, drove all around it to make sure any swing would be a problem. The wind's been out of the south for the last four or five days. It's still predicted to be out of the south for the next five or six. So in the event there was some kind of little squall that came through, it could have shifted winds. But we were good. We had a really good night. Um, we were lazy. We ran the generator. and. Uh, slept with air conditioning all night, so I figured there was nobody around to deal with the noise a little bit, but it was good. So, uh, it is about 7 a.m. this morning. We are up and about, um, just heading out that Romanto River and about to connect with the ICW again right here. to uh, lock through the Leland Bowman locks. Uh, Deb's at the helm. I'm going to man the lines this time. I think we have to tie off on this time. The last one Deb went through, she just was able to sort of float around and hover in it. It was more of a salt freshwater control lock. I believe this is an elevation lock, so we'll see in a minute because I don't really recall. It's been a while since I've been through here. We're getting ready to head through some locks here in just a few minutes. Right now we're waiting for a tug to come out. It is stuck and the lock master took all us through. So as you approach the locks, there is some etiquette and actual regulations around this. One is that anybody that is a line handler on deck must wear a life jacket at all times. So you can see what we're starting to do here is prepare to, um, to go into the locks. I've got my life jacket on, Chastity is in the cockpit, she also has her life jacket on because she may end up being a line handler. So, um, so we're now coiling up the lines and getting them ready in the event that we do have to tie off on the side of the lock. At this point, we're not really sure whether we're going to have a port side or a starboard side tie. So we went ahead and put uh, lines out on both sides attached to the midship cleat so that we could quickly and easily just hook up a single line, use it as a spring line, and either pull forward on that line or pull backward on that line to just basically line the boat up parallel to the actual lock wall. So we got to go ahead and to come on into the lock. and. Just like before, you can see that they ended up not actually even closing the locked doors here. They just had us um, traverse right on through. They had this locked door open. As soon as we got in this one, they started opening up the lock on the other side. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were kind of idling in pretty slow, and as soon as we realized the length of the lock and the fact that the doors were already open on the other side, we went ahead and uh, you know kind of went up to three-quarter throttle again and, uh, and tried to get on through the lock at a pretty good, a pretty good pace. So. Uh, one more lock where we did not have to tie up and there was no elevation change. It was um, easy peasy as they say. Once we realized that we wouldn't have to tie up and got on through the lock, uh, you know, always believe in keeping the boat ship shape, so it was now time to coil all the lines that we'd made ready and uh, got those prepared. So um, here I am on the aft deck just uh, coiling up the stern lines. And to make sure we don't look like a permanent houseboat, uh, always have to make sure we pick up and stow the fenders on deck. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing more embarrassing for a sailor or a boater to be dragging a couple of fenders than the water as they go. Not sure why, but that's what people think, so therefore I don't want to be thought of in that way. <laughs> I go through these interesting takes on this part of the intercoastal waterway. I mean, the water's brown, there's not a ton of wind typically on this part of the waterway and you know on parts of the trip after it's been a six seven eight hour day and you're kinda just looking at this particular view the whole time you start to think eh, it's just not a big fan of this view but and then I sit here and edit the videos and it looks pretty darn nice doesn't it this day we actually had a pretty long um, a pretty long run if I look at the the route here. You can see we went from the Mermintow River where the mouse is and we went, kind of went down into the intercoastal waterway. We went through the locks that uh, you just saw in the video. And we kind of worked our way um, eastbound on the intercoastal waterway. Um, from there we ended up uh, going all the way to an area they refer to as Intercoastal City. Um, it's on the top of Vermilion Bay 
and specifically the place we were going here was a small area called um, Shell Morgan. Um, there's actually a fuel dock there and it's a great little place to pull in and they have a couple of transient slips and there's a grocery store that's very close to it so it's a great stopover. So on this particular day we went ahead and departed the Mermintau River at about 7 uh, a.m. We arrived at um, at Shell Morgan in Intercoastal City at about 2.45 in the afternoon. We, uh, we averaged around 5.3 knots or so, was probably our average cruising speed, and we ran for about seven and a half hours or so. Um, we averaged about 25 to 2650 RPMs or so. Um, and when we arrived at Shell Morgan, one of the best things is that uh, it's a commercial fuel dock, essentially. So we went ahead and got uh, 34 uh, gallons of diesel to top off the tanks, and it was only $1.84 a gallon, so it was phenomenally priced. Transient slips are only $20 a day uh, with either 30 or 50 amp power. So we tied off and uh, we all got off the boat and decided we were going to head on over to the grocery store. And we had only one mission. McKinley, we have to get ice cream? So off we went with Chastity Hall in the wagon on our behalf. Sometimes you call him and you just wait a few minutes because he's swinging around that turn. Probably not easy to pivot that thing. It's probably, I don't know, maybe a hundred yards long. So call him and say, hey, Cap, where do you want me to stay? He said, hug that shoreline for me, partner. There we go. I went ahead and recorded this barge that you just saw approaching us as he passed by, of, uh, by us. I just thought it was interesting just to see the immense size of these things. It truly is amazing. We've seen some significantly larger than this. This was only uh, a single file setup and um, two long. We've seen six of them, two, two wide, three long. Gotta love Louisiana. Just past this, heading westbound on the Intercoastal Waterway. Now that is a living on the water house. When it would get hot outside and the kids needed a break, we would bring them down below in the air conditioning. Uh, here McKinley's demonstrating as the boat rocks just how unstable it made her. But she would lay down on the back bunk and have the air conditioner on and watch a movie or something. Cassidy also managed to entertain herself. If she wanted a little bit of air conditioning, she would come on down below, set up a couple of TV trays, which um, luckily the water was pretty smooth, so I'm sure that it didn't knock over her little arrangement too far. But she would play away on here, and uh, you know, every once in a while she would see us peeking down and seeing what she was doing, and I think she would get embarrassed like she does here in a second. But she, uh, she was having a good time and staying cool.
What flew in the back? What went up your head? What was it? A dragonfly? You like dragonflies? I think there's a dragonfly at the front of the boat. So our plan tonight was to get to um, a place called the Berwick Public Docks. Um, if you if you kind of visualize this, the intercoastal waterway runs east to west. Going northbound is a body of water um, that goes up into Morgan City. On one side of that uh, that river, the east side is the Morgan City Public Docks. Uh, they've been closed and under renovation for almost a full year. Directly across the river from that is the Berwick Public Docks. Uh, there's actually no services there whatsoever, no electricity or anything like that, but they're open and, um, and I've heard really good reviews from Active Captain folks about that being a good place to stop over given Morgan City's uh, closed. So we actually called, um, we called over to Morgan City and spoke to a gentleman that's the harbor master and he let us know that there were actually two slips available um, right between the two bridges. There's a 70-foot um, a bridge and a 50-foot bridge. Um, underneath the 70, but prior to the 50, which worked out very well for us because we fit under the first, not the second, uh, there are, were two slips next to a couple of shrimp boats. Um, and he told us if we could get in there, we could go ahead and um, stay there, and there was power. Uh, he was really nice. He actually said, listen, the place where you, you pay is all torn up, so don't even worry about it. Just uh, you know, plug in, enjoy yourself, make yourself at home. So it worked out pretty well. We. Um, as we pulled up, there's three bridges you have to kind of go through. The first one is a railroad bridge that stays open unless a, a train is coming. Uh, Murphy's Law, we got there, the bridge went down, we ended up waiting about an hour or so for the train to go by. Um, then it's the 70 foot bridge, which is, is a fixed span bridge, and we went through that without a problem. And then the next one's a 50 foot fixed span bridge, and, and obviously we couldn't go under that, and, and the place we needed to stop was right between the two. So it worked out really well. And for anybody that's traveling on this part of the waterway, right as you um, get into Morgan City from either the eastbound or the westbound side of the, side of the ICW, if you contact Berwick Traffic Control, I uh, can't remember if they were on channel 13 or channel 11 on the VHF, but they were really helpful. Um, when I contacted them, still a, a bit west of Morgan City, uh, I gave them the vessel name, told them I was approaching, he asked where I was headed. Um, right away he said, yep, I see you on radar, we'll keep an eye out for you, don't anticipate any traffic concerns, and, and kind of provided me um, with some information. As a matter of fact, he's the one that called and told me on the radio that the, uh, the bridge was going down uh, for the railroad bridge, and I'd have to just wait for it. Unfortunately, when that bridge goes down, there's like a four-foot clearance. It is right on the water. So, um, unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of footage of this. Um, we, were, we were kind of pulling in just as it was getting dark, and um, we first nosed into the slip. Um, because I thought it looked a little bit shallow there, and I'm glad we did. It was shallow, but it was really soft mud. Uh, we were having a hard time getting the power cords to actually reach all the way forward to the pedestal, so we did decide to, um, to pull back out of that. We moved the dinghy to the bow of the boat instead of the stern, and we backed into the slip. And um, I say we backed in as best we could. We definitely, uh, we definitely plowed through a little bit of that soft mud right there along the edge of the bulkhead, but uh, there was probably four and a half foot of clearance, and we needed five, so you know, we just kind of worked our way in a little bit of that mud. We knew that the tide was actually coming in, so in the morning we were going to be a little deeper than we were at this moment anyway. So, uh, with that, good night everybody. We've got our plans for tomorrow, and um, tomorrow we're going to make a run for Homa. It'll be a, uh, it'll be a fairly short run if everything goes well. Good night! Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for weekly updates and like this video.